All right, so good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining us. I'm Todd Allen, the chair of the Department of Nuclear Engineering and Radiological Sciences at the University of Michigan and senior visiting fellow at Third Way. I'm delighted to open the second installment of our Fastest Path to Zero virtual series, which will be a reflection on COP26. Just last month, world leaders convened in Glasgow, Scotland to negotiate the path forward for climate, global climate action in an attempt to limit global warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius. We saw countries strengthen the commitments they made under the Paris Agreement, and we also saw countries make new commitments in, a, in an attempt to cut their greenhouse gas emissions, including new pledges to cut methane and halt deforestation. We also saw the emergence of new collaborations, like the First Movers Coalition, a joint effort led by the US and the World Economic Forum to leverage the purchasing power of the world's largest companies in an effort to expand the market for emerging clean energy technologies. So what does COP26 mean for the future of US clean energy innovation? Today, we're excited to speak with a range of experts for their perspectives on the future of US clean energy innovation and the US's role in commercializing new technologies to support national and global decarbonization efforts and provide economic support. We'll hear from Congressman Don Beyer, who represents Virginia's Congressional District 8. Then we'll hear from a brilliant panel of experts in the climate and clean energy space who are working to advance the next generation of clean energy and innovation policy. All of our panelists attended COP26, and I'm looking forward to hearing their takeaways from the conference. I'm now thrilled to pass it over to Josh Freed, Senior Vice President of the Climate and Energy Program at Third Way, to introduce our keynote speaker. Josh. Thank you, Todd, and thank you for everyone who is joining us uh, this afternoon or morning, depending on where you are. Uh, I'm now delighted to welcome our featured interview, Congressman Don Beyer. Congressman Beyer is currently serving in his fourth term in the U.S. House of Representatives, representing Northern Virginia, the suburbs of the nation's capital, right across the river from where we are today. Uh, the Congressman serves as the chair of the U.S. Joint Economic Committee, and is a member of the House Committee on Ways and Means and the House Committee on Science, Space and Technology, two of our favorite committees from the climate program's perspective, where he chairs the subcommittee on space and aeronautics. He is also a member of the New Democrat Caucus and part of their climate task force. And previously, the Congressman served as the Lieutenant Governor of Virginia and ambassador to Switzerland and has built a very successful family business over the course of the last four decades. Welcome very much, Congressman. Thank you, Josh, very much. It's great to be here. It's excellent to have you. So let's just jump in. At and after the UN Climate Change Conference in Glasgow, the United States has taken a series of actions to curb emissions and accelerate the deployment of innovative technologies that we need, including the president signing the bipartisan infrastructure bill and working to pass Build Back Better. You are at COP26 and are a leader in the House on climate action. Can, can you talk about how these bills position the US to meet the international obligations the Biden administration committed the United States to? And is there more work to be done? Uh, so the second part, yes, there's absolutely more work to be done. But I came away from COP26 really encouraged, really optimistic. Um, among the many meetings that I was part of there was one we spent probably an hour and a half with John Kerry. Uh, and John Kerry had made clear, and we'd, we'd been briefed by him before COP26 too, that for the US, the primary theme was to keep 1.5 alive. The idea of 1.5 degrees centigrade since 1900. We're already at 1.1. So we, we, we've blown uh, you know, more than two thirds of, of that goal. Uh, but without, without COP26, you know, we look like we could be north of three and maybe even north of four degrees centigrade. Uh, John Kerry said, um, this was two or three days before the end, before some of the China stuff emerged, that he be believed that the net result of COP26 was 1.7 degrees by 2050, which is pretty darn good. I mean, if we're only two tenths of a degree off with another 28 years to, to improve things, uh, all the better. And to your direct question, Josh, just the, the infrastructure bill and build back better together are $924 billion in climate change stuff. That's 10 times the $90 billion that we had in the, the, you know, the big stimulus bill in the first year of Barack Obama, way the most that we've ever had. We can talk about the different pieces of it. Um, I'm thrilled that Mitch Landrieu is gonna lead the infrastructure piece, which will include you know, uh, bringing the electrical grid up to 21st century standards which saves a, a tremendous amount of energy. 
all the bridges and highways, you know, it's subtle, but all the time that we're not spending in traffic um, is, is going to help that too. And then Build Back Better, of course, is the really big thing, $555 billion worth of climate change investments. We still have to get it through Joe Manchin. I know that uh, most people are pretty encouraged, though, that, that the pieces that Manchin seems to have trouble with in Build Back Better are um, paid maternity leave for God knows whatever reason, the payments for children for whatever reason. Um, but the, And he was always concerned about the overall cost. But he was saying, you know, no more than a, a, a trillion seven fifty, and the latest CBO score came in at a tr trillion seven. So we're already less than what he said was was his number. So, you know, Chuck Schumer thinks that perhaps we can get it done before Christmas, the twenty fourth. Uh, I'm rooting for him because it would be great to be able to go into the new year with Build Back Better already signed. Well, it, it, let's assume for a moment that uh, that the holiday season delivers us build back better to the president's desk. Um, you know, we talk about politics as the art of the possible, just focusing on on future legislation for one moment. What's possible over the next year? Are there other things that as you look at what else Congress might need to do around climate and clean energy that you think is on should be on the agenda and is possible to get done? Uh, well, there it's a really big list, Josh. I think the very first thing is making Build Back Better actually real in our lives. You know, the president appointed Gene Sperling to manage the American Rescue Plan and Mitch Landry to deal. I'm hoping he'll find somebody of that quality to lead Build Back Better. You know, the, I've been deeply involved in all the tax credit pieces because I was on the Ways and Means Committee. So the huge tax credit for the electrification of passenger automobiles. Um, I sponsored the legislation for, I think it's a 30% tax credit for shifting over our commercial vehicle fleet, the trucks, the vans, the big rigs to electric. Um, we have another piece in there that subsidizes the purchase of electric school buses, electric transit buses, where a tax credit doesn't help the city of Alexandria, but a, a check does help, help them buy that bus. But all that stuff has got to be put together. And then moving back to the infrastructure bill, you know, 550,000 or 500,000 electrical charging stations to get rid of range anxiety across the country. There are many, many, many different pieces in it that someone's going to need to implement well. You know, I'm a Democrat, so I believe that um, government can be a positive force in our life, but it has to be good government, um, not, not, not ineffective uh, government. And then if we look forward, uh, I think one of the biggest bills coming, not likely by the end of this year, but certainly in the first quarter, is uh, what the Senate's called the China Bill. It's called USICA in the Senate, uh, the United States Something Innovation and Competitiveness Act, and the House was called the National Science Foundation for the Future, but a doubling and then a tripling of our investment in basic research, much of which will be climate related, um, but also uh, you know, building a lot more infrastructure in America. There's a $52 billion piece in there just for chip manufacturers. Um, hopefully, we will use this incredible investment in American innovation and our science um, to also figure out a lot of really new important things when it comes to climate change. As we have seen in virtually every element of climate, the costs are coming down pretty quickly on, on, uh, on, on wind, on solar, on geothermal, um, anything that'll help us move us away from the fossil fuels. So if, and we've talked about two aspects, we've talked about the, and particularly even in, in terms of how it impacts the American public and your constituents in Virginia, where Build Back Better and the infrastructure bill uh, can help both reduce emissions and in, in particularly with refer, reference to USICA, also make America more competitive, not just with China, but globally around these clean energy technologies that the world is moving towards. The other component we've seen a lot about in the press lately has been uh, energy prices. And can you talk a little bit about how Build Back Better and the provisions will help Americans deal with high fossil fuel prices? And does Build Back Better or other actions that we've seen in COP or other places also help the U.S. reduce its reliance on, on foreign energy or our vulnerability to global energy price swings? Yeah, Josh, I certainly hope so. Uh, I filled up my car yesterday. It was $4.11 a gallon. 
and I wouldn't put in the high price stuff in there. So that's got to be a, a really hard thing for so many, many Americans. But uh, the, my, the many friends I have that either have EV cars or hybrid cars are not spending any of that money. Um, they, they got ahead of the curve and figured it out. So as we move to the electrification, you know, General Motors says 100% by 2035. I think the commitment that the big manufacturers made to President Biden was 50% by 2030. I've been involved with dealer off and on for 48 years, and they'll be 100% electric by 2030. And there are other manufacturers who will beat that. So that's going to help. But then also to the extent that there are other things like um, hydrogen is rearing its lovely head uh, in a number of places. Um, we, I just came from George Mason University where their, their brand new seven story building will be net, at net zero energy. Uh, we're seeing more and more of, of that. Um, there's even, I know this, there are skeptics out there, but there are four major nuclear fusion companies working around the world, right around the country right now. Uh, Commonwealth Fusion just raised almost $2 billion last week in the, the first public offering. Um, there are so many different initiatives we have that are not fossil fuel based. And, you know, we're not going to be picking winners or losers, but there are going to be a bunch of winners. Yeah. Um, well, one more that, that's really exciting to me is if Virginia is about to do the largest offshore wind power uh, in the country's history, which is going to power a significant um, subset of our state without using any fossil fuels at all. Uh, we just have to keep going down that road as aggressively as we can and, and, and champion and, and acclaim every little success that we have. Yeah, and, and, and that's really helpful. And, and you really have captured just, I mean, in this one answer, a number of the innovative technologies we're starting to see get developed and deployed in the United States. You've repeatedly written to the House Appropriations Committee asking them to secure or raise federal funding levels for innovation programs like RPE. And as you wrote, the federal clean energy innovation system has a profound impact on American lives. And can you talk about, you know, based on your experience at COP, why do you see clean energy innovation is so critical for US energy leadership and, and for the American public? But Josh, it was, it was really interesting. A long time ago, December, 2009, uh, I was already in Europe, so we flew up to to Copenhagen for COP15. And oh my God, that was a really discouraging time. Yeah. You know, at that point, we couldn't get anything through Congress. We were trying to beat on Russia, China, India, Brazil to step up to the plate. And we, we could show no instance of, of U.S. leadership on this. Uh, now, with what we've done in, in the last couple of years, um, especially in the Obama years and now in the first year of Joe Biden, we have a lot to talk about. And even though Putin and Xi didn't come to, to Glasgow, they sent really major delegations and, and really did good things out of that. But the investment in RPE, you know, Donald Trump zeroed the RPE budget four years in a row in his president's budget. And we fought and successfully put it back because this is where uh, some of the most important ideas in the world are coming out of the federal government coming out of our, our federally funded research and development labs. You know, everyone points to the internet, which the federal government developed at, at DARPA, not RPE. Uh, two of my favorite little examples is a refrigerator today, which works just as cold as one in 1975, uses half the energy. Or even better, Stephen Chu said at COP15 in Denmark, uh, back then when you had a modem on your desk for your computer, you put your hand on it and it would burn your hand. Um, now they use 10% the electricity a motor does that it did 10 years ago. And these are innovations that the federal government helped to lead. And Josh, as you may remember, uh, Tom Friedman wrote a book about 15 years ago saying 21st century economy is going to belong to the people who invest in green energy. And we're now really seeing that coming to pass. That's, that, that's a great segue to the, the last question I have. And I really appreciate the, the time you've provided us today and, and these really insightful answers. You're a member of the New Democrat Coalition. Uh, President Biden was elected as a moderate Democrat, and both are dedicated to pro-economic growth, pro-innovation, fiscally responsible policies. Can you just put in context both all of the climate legislation and action we just talked about, President Biden and the United States re-entry into COP and our leadership there, how does that fit within sort of a moderate, centrist vision that, that you and the president and others are leading for this country? I think really sensibly. 
I'm, I'm very proud to be part of the new Democrat coalition. Chairman Susan Del Bene, just done a wonderful job this year um, with many visits to the White House. Um, I, I, you know, because we are, we want good trade, we want innovation, we want competitiveness, we want our business community to be strong. Um, we remember, you know, the uh, our businesses are the ones that are creating the jobs that we want for the American people. So I think this is just a wonderful opportunity. And even I'd say maybe the most conservative subset, the blue dogs and, and the, the most conservative part of the new Dem coalition, people like Stephanie Murphy are very committed to climate change. Uh, Abigail Spanberger, who is very clearly um, a, a more conservative member of the of the House, has to be to survive in the district that she had. Um, well, has say will tell you her number one priority is climate change. So I, I think that this works for us all around. By the way, Josh, one of the important parts about New Dems is we believe in good management, good leadership, and you, we saw so much of the federal workforce gutted. I talked to an EPA senior person the other day, a thousand people left the EPA in the Trump administration. Um, the State Department was just gutted under, under Pompeo and Tillerson. We've got a lot of work to do to build back the core of professionals, especially in this climate space. Gina McCarthy is a great blessing as is John Kerry, uh, Michael Reagan at, at EPA, but we have a lot of work to do. Well, that's, that's a great place to wrap up our conversation. And we really appreciate your leadership and the partnership that you've provided with us over the last several years and uh, continue to we look forward to continuing to work with you. Thank you so much. Uh, but really Josh, Josh, Third Way is, is one of our most trusted sources of great new ideas. So uh, thank you for your leadership and we'll try to follow up on every good idea you send us. <laughs> really appreciate it. And we'll, we'll take you up on that. Uh, with that, thank you very much, uh, Congressman Beyer. And I'm thrilled to introduce my colleague, uh, Lindsay Walter to introduce and moderate our panel. Lindsay? Thanks, Josh. Hi, everyone. I'm Lindsay Walter. I am the Deputy Director of the Climate and Energy Program at Third Way. I am excited to introduce our panel today discussing reflections on COP26 and where clean energy technology innovation fits into these new commitments and broader climate goals. Our panelists represent a wide range of expertise in the climate and energy sphere, so I'm looking forward to the conversation. First, we have Akshat Rati, a climate change reporter for uh, Bloomberg News. We have Jason Bordoff, co-founding dean of the Cl uh, Columbia Climate School and founding director of the Center on Global Energy Policy at Columbia University. Also joining us is Sarah Ladislaw, managing director of the US program at Rocky Mountain Institute, or RMI. And lastly, we have Evan Gonzalez, a PhD candidate in the Nuclear Engineering and Radiological Sciences program at the University of Michigan. So thank you all for joining us today. As a reminder, we'll reserve the last 10 minutes of this event for audience Q&A. Please feel free to submit your questions through the Q&A function. So I'd like to start with a question directed towards Jason. Jason, COP26 was not your first rodeo. Uh, what progress have you seen uh, made at COP specifically on the inclusion of clean energy innovation and emerging energy technologies? Do you think that COP26 reflected any kind of turning point for world leaders to understand the immense role that innovation will play in supporting our national and international decarbonization strategies? Uh, yeah, well, first, Lindsay, thanks for the invitation to be here, and thanks to Josh and all the great work that you do at Third Way every day, and really enjoyed hearing from Congressman Byer, who's been such a leader on these issues. Um, I don't know if it was a turning point, but it was definitely continued uh, momentum in the right direction to understand the importance of innovation. First, to elevate the ambition and uh, help people understand how much more work there is to do. So elevated ambition and stronger targets from governments and from the private sector and the financial sector, I think, were important outcomes from COP. Um, Congressman Byer said, uh, you know, John Kerry noted, we, if you look at all the 2050 uh, targets. We are on a path for 1.7 degrees. I think we should put a big kind of asterisk on that and come back to that because that is not the current pathway we are on. That um, We can come back to that. So it's important for people to just recognize we still have a lot of work to do to be on that kind of pathway. And innovation, to your point, is critical to that. So I, I, I was um, encouraged that at, at COP at how much agreement there was among governments, among civil society, among the environmental 
community um, and other stakeholders about the need. First, we have a lot of the tools we need uh, in renewable energy, and we can need to scale those quickly. And we need to, as you're working on and RMI and others, think about the not just the technology, but the non-technical barriers to scale. It is hard to permit and site clean energy, and we need to put a lot of steel on the ground quickly, especially with hopefully the funding that's coming to do that electric vehicles. So we need to deploy what we have today. And then we have a lot of work to do to commercialize technologies that are not quite there yet. The IEA ballpark estimate, you know, about half of the cumulative emission reductions between now and 2050 in a net zero scenario will come from technologies not yet available at commercial scale. And the amount of private capital going into, we just heard fusion, whether it's advanced nuclear or hydrogen, blue and green, uh, uh, carbon capture, carbon removal, a range of technologies that we're going to need for sectors that may be harder to electrify and we're going to need all tools, uh, including renewables, but more than just renewables. I think there was a growing understanding of that and a lot of policy support and a lot of support in the environmental community and in the private sector for uh, moving more urgently on that full range of technologies. So I thought that was um, really encouraging. And we mapped out some of what that could look like in this book we put out about a year, year and a half ago called Energizing America, where the Center on Global Energy Policy laid out a roadmap for how we might think about a national energy innovation mission. What would it look like to really go big and scale clean energy R&D, not just uh, basic research, but demonstration, deployment, commercialization kind of funding. And you do see a lot of the ideas in that book actually incorporated in what we see, not just in the bipartisan infrastructure bill, but Build Back Better, which hopefully will become law soon. Thank you, Jason. And I'm going to ask a quick follow up question, which I wasn't necessarily planning on. But since you were discussing Energizing America, where you more or less offer a roadmap to triple federal funding for clean energy innovation by 2025, you know, you alluded to a lot of this funding being in the infrastructure package. But could you just elaborate a little bit on if that funding in the uh, in the infrastructure package is in line with this roadmap that you outlined in the book? Um, a lot of it is. I mean, I think we still have more work uh, to do. The question we were trying to answer was, if you want to go big on clean energy R&D, what does that look like? How big do you go? How much do you spend? When do you start to see diminishing returns on government spending? When do you crowd out private sector spending? Do you want early stage or tax credits or loan guarantees? What are the most effective tools to put that, that, that spending to work? So that's what we tried to answer in the book. And we called for roughly tripling federal clean energy funding by 2025, and then laid out a few different priority areas for where we thought that that should go. The um, the infrastructure bill, you know, has a lot of, I mean, it, it's not as much as we laid out, we thought would it would be useful to spend, but there's some pretty important stuff in there. It's, uh, $7 billion in supply chain for batteries, around 20 or $22 billion for clean energy demonstration and research hubs on next generation technologies hydrogen, carbon capture, advanced nuclear, um, all of this adds up to, you know, pretty significant uh, spending. And I think it's a real step forward in the government's commitment to clean energy, uh, our D&D. But it's going to require an ongoing commitment to ensure that this support is not just a one-off and not just a one-time surge in funding, but that the government continues to provide important funding and thinks about how it can deploy that funding in ways that will best catalyze private spending. Yeah. Absolutely. I'm glad that you bring up the point of the importance of sustained funding rather than just a one time influx of it. It's definitely very important. I want to turn now to Akshat. You covered a lot of the action at COP26 uh, from some of the most notable commitments made inside the conference to activist protests on the street of, of Glasgow. Um, and, you know, a small fraction of the global community that cares about climate change is actually able to go to COP. And we get a lot of the reverberations and feedback from COP through the media. So from a journalist perspective, what were some of the major themes that you recognize the media latching on to? And has innovation risen to the level of some of the major themes that you were identifying? Yeah, that's a very good question. I mean, COP26 this time around had something like 30,000 participants come through despite COVID restrictions. Uh, but that's a tiny, tiny fraction uh, of the people who will be needed to be involved in the energy transition, let alone the rest of the world's population. Um, it's also a place where the people who come um, are very well aware of the issues at hand and, and, um, and are, are well versed with 
uh, acronyms and, and terminologies uh, that are part of the climate conversation, which again uh, are necessary for, for us to do the work, but um, for a larger population to be brought on board with those uh, is, is not easy. Um, and, and you know we as journalists get a, a privileged position to go into these rooms uh, and be able to translate some of that for a larger audience. Um, it was my first COP and uh, it was an amazing experience, uh, you know, just to be able to see uh, the, the broad swath of humanity after being locked down for two years in one place, uh, caring about uh, climate issues. Um, you know, one thing to notice, even though this was my first COP, I've been writing about climate change for six or seven years now, and um, there has been a marked shift in uh, our conversation uh, around uh, energy innovation specifically, because uh, you know we have seen real life examples in renewable energy technologies as to what can happen when not just funding for new technologies is given, but also support in, in policy is given for deployment of these technologies. Um, and the deployment of these technologies is different in the US than it is in India, than it is in Zambia. And all those places require different uh, injections of innovation. Um, and again, we have just only recently started to, to connect those dots. Um, so at, at COP26, you know, obviously for what the meeting is, which is mostly about countries and who does what and who pays for what, Innovation plays a small role, but uh, there was a broad recognition, I would say, that innovation forms this base layer for us to be able to do more on climate um, going forward. Thank you so much. Um, Sarah, I'm going to turn to you now. Um, in addition to managing the U.S. program for RMI, you also help out with global initiatives like Mission Possible Partnership, which is designed to reduce industrial sector emissions. And as I'm sure you're well aware, curbing industrial emissions is one of the greatest hurdles to reaching net zero, and yet the solutions are less frequently discussed. So what commitments or progress was made at COP26 uh, to reduce industrial emissions that you were tracking and uh, commitments to develop new low carbon technologies needed for that sector? Yeah, thanks very much. And thanks for having me for the discussion. I think actually there was a very sophisticated discussion on innovation at this COP relative to other COPs in a number of perspectives. And they're really important for some of the work that we're doing in industrial decarbonization, which, you know, as you mentioned, and I think as Jason mentioned earlier, they're difficult to abate sectors. They're the technologies for which we have, you know, some technologies under uh, development, but none really at commercial scale and certainly not developed along time scales that are going to be necessary for decarbonizing cement or steel or shipping or trucking or any of those types of things. And one of the things I was particularly pleased about at this COP is that we weren't sort of treating innovation as something that happens over there in a lab somewhere else external from the market. But we understood that in order to make the timeframes of emissions reduction that we need by 2030, we're going to have to approach this from a different perspective. Some of the very ideas that were in the, the book that Jason and his group put out last year, which is you're, we're going to need to have public-private partnerships. We're going to need to align value chains. We're going to need to have applied research and demonstration. We're going to have to have cooperation and commitments that have to do with policy and finance and demand. You've got to kind of make these markets while you're innovating on these technologies. And I think that that happened in a pretty important way across many of the industrial emissions sectors. I, I will say, I don't know if anybody else had this experience, but I couldn't walk down the hall without having a conversation with somebody on hydrogen. It was an amazing, uh, sort of, you know, surprise for those of us who, you know, worked on those issues for a while to say, geez, why is everybody talking about hydrogen in this very sort of hyper frenetic way? And part of the answer is, is because it can make contributions to so many end sectors that are difficult to find answers to. And there's just a lot of excitement about how you can align market conditions uh, to be able to deliver on those things. So even before you got to uh, the, the COP, there was a lot of, you know, initiatives that were based upon this idea of creating sector by sector collaboration efforts, whether it was the first mover coalition or mission possible partnership, which is the one that we're engaged in. But there were also things like the quad agreement, you know, this, the, you know, US, uh, India, uh, uh, 
uh, Japan Korea partnership to, to create uh, you know, hydrogen corridors, hydrogen shipping corridors. There was the Clyde Bank declaration. There was the H2 cities announcement. I mean, everywhere you look, there's this idea of marrying up public and private sector efforts with um, place-based experiences to deploy these technologies. So it was actually quite an exciting time to see uh, how much collaboration was going on to try to think about these sector deployment strategies and how to make progress on them in timeframes that were accelerated. Thank you, Sarah. And I love your running list in your head of all the commitments and agreements that were made at COP. It actually was very impressive. And I want to get back to a few of them. But first, um, Evan, I want to get to you. Uh, you are a PhD student in nuclear engineering, and you attended COP26 as part of the student delegation with the University of Michigan. So you saw quite up close countries make significant progress on nuclear energy at COP26, including a number of commitments from countries to build out advanced nuclear reactors as part of their decarbonization strategy. I uh, also flagged that the US signed a joint agreement between the US company NuScale and Nuclear Electrica uh, for Romania to develop advanced reactors or small modular reactors as part of uh, their decarbonization plan. What are some of the broader implications of all of these agreements and progress, notably at COP26, for the future of the nuclear industry? Right. So this was my first COP. Um, so I'm not too sure what the role of nuclear was in the past, but from what I've gathered, it wasn't very significant. So I heard a lot of people describing this year as like a watershed moment for nuclear, which is it's kind of funny because when you're there, the conference is huge. This there's so much going on. There's hydrogen, like Sarah talked about. There's biodiversity topics, and nuclear seems like such a tiny fraction. But the community is so excited about what's going on. So um, they're kind of like you know they said that they announced uh, Romania's building a new scale SMR. So that's that's huge for us because we're looking at our, like with the ARDP program, Advanced Reactor Demonstration Program, we're looking at building the first of a kind reactors, but there's no path to commercial commercialization if there's no market for these reactors, right? And uh, the new scale project in particular is looking at replacing a coal-fired plant, a retired coal-fired plant, and replacing the heat source with a nuclear reactor. And Eastern Europe is really dependent on coal right now. And as they start to transition away from coal, they're going to need to replace these communities uh, with skilled workforce, right? So nuclear is a good option for that. Um, as far as innovation is concerned, um, that's this bit we need a, a, fuel, a supply chains, for example, in the United States. Uh, HALU fuel is a uh, high assay, low enriched uranium. It's, uh, we're going to need to in, develop that capacity to build these reactors out and actually commercialize them. So Build Back Better has some language to support that type of uh, infrastructure. Uh, one of the reasons that we've seen these big failures for large scale gigawatt scale nuclear reactors in the past, their failures are that we don't have the domestic capacity anymore to build things like large pressure uh, pressure vessels, things like that in the United States. So with small reactors, we can hopefully integrate them and build them maybe in a factory and deploy them, ship them internationally. So these types of innovations are crucial for us and it's exciting to see the advancements and the announcements come along that we're building internationally. Thank you, Evan. And you know, this is my first COP too, and I heard the same from the nuclear community. We even hosted a, a couple different nuclear-related events at COP, and it definitely did seem to be one of the first COPs that had such a, an outspoken coalition of support for nuclear. So uh, it's interesting to hear your perspective. Uh, a follow-up question for you, Evan. Did you get a sense from coming from a university, having opportunities to collaborate with universities around the world to help through innovation, to deliver additional solutions and tools. Were there any conversations in your participation in COP about the role of universities in the broader innovation supply chains and, uh, and, and progress? Sure, yeah. Um... I think a lot of people forget that we talk about how education in this country is failing, right? But higher education is, you know, very strong, like more than half of the world's top ranked universities come from the United States. And so when you talk to people from other countries and you're excited about deploying nuclear, not only in the US, but in Eastern Europe and in Southeast Asia and places where uh, transitioning from coal is going to become important, uh, they don't really have a strong 
uh, nuclear infrastructure. And so a lot of their, uh, you see a lot of students wanting to come to the United States to study at American universities, study nuclear engineering technologies where they might not have that opportunity in their home countries. And so there's definitely lots of room for collaboration. Um, yeah, definitely. Thank you, Evan. Uh, turning back to Akshat for a moment. So we, we talked about some of your coverage of COP26 and in your final article uh, you on making sense of the narratives after the Glasgow comment, uh, climate talks, you cited both world leaders who celebrated the progress made at COP26 and those who think that the conference didn't go far enough to prevent catastrophic climate impacts. You know, Jason mentioned in his kind of opening remarks that all the commitments put together get us to about 1.7 degrees C. I'm curious from your perspective, where you view clean energy innovation as help, helping to close that gap to get all the way to 1.5 degrees Celsius. Uh, that's actually a really interesting piece to bring up because I feel like even on innovation, uh, you know, there is uh, perhaps more agreement than not, but there is still, there are still two camps, um, you know, the people who, who claim that there was no progress or very little progress made at COP26 are also the people who say, we have all the technologies we need, we just need to get on with it and, and deploy them. Um, forgetting that even the deployment of the very technologies we have require innovation for them to be able to go to all the markets that we need to put them in. Um, so there is still a divide in trying to understand the role of innovation that it will play in uh, getting us to net zero and at the pace at which we have to do it. Um, and as Jason pointed out, uh, we are not on track. So yes, if all commitments are met, we could be on 1.7 degrees Celsius by 2050 with an error margin that still puts us at three degrees Celsius or perhaps below 1.5 degrees Celsius. And, and we, don't, we shouldn't forget that these temperature targets are bound by error margins so huge that we are still far off the target. And if those commitments aren't met, if the policies are as they are today, we are at a track for 2.4 or 2.7 degrees Celsius, somewhere between that range. And you know, those are disastrously high temperatures. Um, and so we shouldn't forget that we need everything we can throw at this problem um, and innovation will be absolutely key for us to be able to make progress uh, on, on, emission, on cutting emissions really fast. Absolutely. Um, and I think the 1.5 degree special report that came out from the IPCC really made it a strong case for how important it is to stay there versus two degrees Celsius. It's a, a huge Im a difference in impacts on our on our climate. Jason, I want to turn to you with a, a bit of a political question, actually. So for democracies, like the US, we, we not only need to show progress on our climate goals for broader impacts, but political wins as well. How do you strike the balance between being America benefiting directly from the development and export of these technologies versus our responsibility to provide clean technologies for other countries, especially developing nations as they look to industrialize and meet their own climate goals? Yeah, thanks. And I'll say two quick things on what's been said and, and then answer your question. So first, you know, Akshat made a really important point and sort of said, if we fail to meet the mid-century targets, 2.4, 2.7, that would assume that the NDCs for 2030 are met. And even that, I think we need to do more work to be on track for that. The United States has an NDC of 50 to 52 percent reduction by 2030. I hope Build Back Better passes. That doesn't get us all the way there. We will have more work to do. And if we don't, we'll fall short. And that's true for many other countries, too. You mentioned the role of collaboration and partnerships with universities. So in the spirit of shameless self-promotion, the university building the first climate school is, uh, is all about partnerships and how we're going to work with stakeholders in the civil society and in the private sector to figure out how we're going to get this work done and work with all the groups here on this uh, Zoom. And you know, your question is a really good one because it's often framed as if, if, if we are so far behind the curve, we need to deploy zero carbon energy so fast. And I guess I would put it this way, if we believe the language we use, like existential and crisis, which I do, you might say we maybe would care less about where solar panels are made 
and more about how cheap they are and how fast we can put them up and get zero carbon energy deployed. Um, but it matters where they're made, not just for US economic opportunities and jobs, but if they're being made with slave labor in other parts of the world, we have a range of priorities and values that we care about. And so we need to balance all of those trade-offs. I do think it is possible to do both of these things. In a world of that is on track for anything close to 1.5 or net zero, we still need a lot of global trade. As the IEA tells us in its net zero report, less of that will be oil and gas, more of it will be things like hydrogen, which goes from zero to 30% of global energy related trade in the net zero scenario, or critical minerals, which go from 10 to 50% of energy related trade. So we need a lot of trade, um, but we also have huge opportunities to build new industries. And I think the US is actually pretty well positioned when you think about the advantages in terms of low cost energy, access to good ports, a whole range of industrial infrastructure. What are the attributes that would allow a country to be successful in hydrogen or in carbon capture? I mean, there's no reason US companies can't lead in those technologies. And that is not only good for the US economy. One thing we haven't talked about, and I hope we'll have a few minutes to come back to, that was clearly on display in Glasgow, was the rising, not shrinking tension between developed and developing economies. And we simply can't ask the poorest countries in the world who are experiencing the most rapid rates of economic growth, have the fewest resources to make the transition or deal with the impacts of climate and have not caused this problem in terms of historical emissions to spend you know, three, four or five times as much on green steel or green cement. The cost of those have to come down if we're to expect those countries to build cities and highways and roads and infrastructure in a different way. If we're leading in those technologies, we're not just developing those economic opportunities here at home, but we're driving down the cost of those technologies to make it potentially more affordable for others to adopt. I think that brings us back a bit to what Sarah was discussing earlier. It's certainly in the industrial sector, a lot of these developing countries looking to, to increase their own industrialization and having access to low carbon technologies. Sarah, we talked, or you mentioned the First Movers Coalition and a few other commitments that were made at COP. Do these commitments made, uh, or will these commitments increase the accessibility of low carbon solutions to curb industrial emissions for developing countries? Yes, I'm not sure the first mover coalition like in and of itself is the only way to think about that. I mean, I again, going back to what I said earlier, I do actually think this is another area where we experienced some sophistication in how these partnerships are being formed, right? So the First Movers Coalition, for those who don't know what it is, is essentially an advanced market purchasing commitment by a bunch of companies in the seven sort of hard to abate sectors, plus in a sector about direct air capture, um, basically designed different from other advanced market purchasing commitments to say, we wanna pull in the most uh, uh, sort of innovative of technologies into the market. And so spreading that risk down into the entire value chain so that those mar the, that, that signal can be sent about those like say truly green, green steel, not just greener steel like type of things can make it into the market. So it's innovative in that sense. But I think if you look across the board, a lot of these partnerships and quite frankly, a lot of the initiatives being taken by the Biden administration are about trying to think about if you're going to create value chains for new technologies and you're going to be strategic about it and try to compete whatever you know to, to whatever end that you do that you do have to be able to include developing economies in that innovation cycle right they should be part of how you're thinking about deploying those technologies so they're not left to the side if you think about all of the innovation that needs to take place at the rate and pace that is necessary to meet our 2030 or our 2050 targets, and you think about specifically designing developing countries to be part of that experience, this is probably one of the biggest opportunities we've had to get this right, right? I mean, really thinking about how to incorporate development finance and you know blended finance and all of the things that we were talking about into these demonstration uh, experiences there's a lot that be, can be done to sort of, you know, uh, overcome that rift and that tension between, you know, whether green industrial competitiveness is really just going to be for developing con developed countries and not really shared with developing countries. I, I think there was enormous progress being made there. We just need to actually make that um, come into fruition over the next few years. Akshat, I saw you nodding your head vigorously in agreement. Do you want to add something? 
I I thought one thing uh, worth remembering is that uh, it's it's the U.S. where the solar panel was invented. It's the U.S. where the lithium-ion battery was invented, um, and yet it's you know solar panel manufacturing is now happening mostly in China or in Southeast Asia. Lithium-ion battery manufacturing is mostly happening in uh, Japan and China and, and uh, South Korea. Um, and of course, electric cars are built on lithium-ion batteries. So those are also the markets which are leading uh, in electric cars. And so there's real important lesson that we need to learn from that, which is it's not just about backing innovation for a certain amount of period of time, but backing it all through to uh, fruition so that it's, a, you know, the countries that innovate on it are able to draw the value from that innovation, uh, not just be able to then pass the baton on to another country. Uh, and there may not be another country that may take that baton on. Um, and so uh, with all these uh, plans that we are getting, they are plans that go out, you know, five, year, five or 10 years, the First Movers Coalition actually kicks in post 2030. So it's sort of a, uh, you know, much, much farther looking uh, idea. Uh, but if we are to meet these goals, we do have to make sure that there is consistency as much as possible and a much longer term support towards innovation. Thank you so much. I'm going to actually bring in a question that I'm seeing from the audience Q&A here, because I think it's relevant to this discussion. The question is what, um, how should the U.S. address potential the potential for supply side vulnerabilities to su uh, to supplies of key minerals for the clean energy supply chain? Sorry, I kind of butchered that question, but I think the the gist of it is, you know, we're talking about supply chains, we're talking about getting multiple countries involved in the development, innovation, and production of innovative clean energy technologies, but there's a huge part of these key minerals that are part of the supply chain. So how should we be thinking about potential vulnerabilities in the development of these technologies because of these supply chain vulnerabilities? Jason, maybe we start with you, because I know that this is something you've covered a bit, especially on a recent piece released on the geopolitics of clean energy. I think this gets looped in. Yeah, I'd love to hear what Sarah has to say too, because uh, not just RMI, but before she left CSIS, they did some really good work yeah. on this uh, topic. Um, and and I think it is, um, the, we have about the top oil suppliers in the world, Saudi, Russia, and the United States each produce about 10% of world supply. One country produces more than 50% of rare earth elements, of lithium, of cobalt. So there's much more dominance in terms of the production, and even more so in the refining and processing of many of these, which uh, is, is, is largely in, in China. I think that is uh, an important concern, um, and, and, there, and, and we can talk about the steps you need to take in supply chains to deal with that. I, I think it's one that over time, uh, it is there are more opportunities to make progress on diversifying supply chains and increasing energy security. Uh, then may be true for a, geologic, a, a scarce geologic resource like oil that is in certain places, but not others. I think uh, with my colleagues at the Electrochemical Energy Center here at Columbia, optimistic about the new uh, chemistries that will develop and the ability to build uh, technologies for storage or other clean energy materials that uh, rely on more plentiful uh, material minerals and, and, and materials. Uh, materials than some of the things that we're using today. There are a lot of increased options for recycling that we're not doing enough on today. And we, there are many other parts of the world where these can be developed. Uh, we just haven't done that yet. So in the same way that roughly every 30 years for the last 150 years, there's been a scare that the world's running out of oil. And it turns out in response, <laughs> In response to higher prices driven by that scarcity concern, we figure out new and innovative ways to extract things. I think there are opportunities where that will help in with some of the critical minerals we need. And then there are a host of other environmental and human rights and other issues in, in thinking about how we develop those and where. But there is a lot we can do to enhance security of supply chains, not just by domesticating some of that, but also by diversifying it. I think energy security, most importantly, comes from diversification and optionality, uh, not necessarily from having to make everything here at home. Sarah, could you weigh in on this question as well, please? 
Yeah, no, I think by and large, Jason got it right. But the issue is we've known that formula, right? So diversification of supply chains, recycling, you know, finding alternative materials, and then producing this stuff at home to be, you know, good global contributors to those supply chains, right? I mean, there's a bit of this where it's like, we just preferred having that stuff done somewhere else. It's probably not the most responsible tack to take. But I think actually, Jason, uh, David Sandalo, your colleague, and a couple other people wrote a very good strategy on this a number of years ago in the Obama administration. I think bipartisan approach to this has been the same. We just don't do it. So doing it is really the key here. And I think we're starting to make some, some progress because now it's part of a, a technology and a, a, a series of markets that we see as strategically important in a way that we maybe didn't you know, a decade ago. Absolutely. I want to drag Evan back into this, uh, speaking a little bit about supply chains around nuclear reactors. Uh, we were beginning to touch on it a bit in his opening remarks, but uh, you know, we have uh, funding through 2025 for the Advanced Reactor Demonstration Program in the U.S. Evan, from your perspective, what is the role of the U.S. in developing supply chains for advanced nuclear exports? And is there room for collaboration with other countries as part of developing these advanced nuclear supply chains? Uh, sure. So like I, I talked, I touched on HALU a little bit. So we need to make sure that we have a fuel source for these reactors. Right now, most commercial reactors operate on three to five percent enrichment. We need to up that to around 20% enrichment for most of these advanced reactor designs. Currently, if we want uh, that type of enrichment capacity, we have to outsource to other countries like Russia. So we need to make sure that we're not dependent on Russia or other countries developing these types of enrichment technologies like China to import uh, fuel. Um, we also need to make sure that we can test our own advanced reactor material components so that things like the versatile test reactor that provide a high flux environment and a high energy environment to make sure that our materials are qualified to go inside of new nuclear reactors. Uh, currently, the only fast reactor in operation is in Russia. So things like that. And then I talked about uh, if we want to make sure that we want to make sure that we're not dependent on companies outside of the US to provide critical reactor components, things like the pressure vessels, and think, things like that to make sure that we can actually uh, source these things inside the United States. That's what makes it so expensive and hard to develop uh, new reactors, like in the projects like in Georgia and South Carolina, where they're going way over budget and way over timelines, because we haven't really built new reactors in this country over the last 30, 40 years. And we kind of lost that institutional knowledge and the supply chain to develop these. And so now uh, we touched on how the countries that are first to corner the markets on solar, like uh, well, we invented solar here, but China really brought the price down. Denmark brought the price of wind down, and they kind of have a, the, mar the largest market share of these technologies, right? So if we want to ensure that nuclear is strong, uh, the US and Canada, and to some extent, the UK are leading the way on these advanced reactor designs. Mm -hmm. And if we want the rest of the world to uh, buy them from us and make sure that our industries are surviving and, and thriving, we need to be the first to innovate on these technologies and ensure that the supply chain comes directly from the United States. And there's also an important national security reason for that, not just domestic economic activity, I think. Definitely. Absolutely. Okay, I wanna to turn to one of the questions I'm seeing in the chat, um, which relates to a conversation we were having earlier with Sarah, uh, when we were doing some panel prep, honestly, was, thinking about, we've talked about a lot of capital being mobilized, both private sector, capital, um, a lot of investments from governments around the world to some of these climate initiatives. There's now a huge need and question around the implementation of all of these funds. We have a lot of money committed. How are we good stewards of this money? How do we make sure that it's being invested in the climate solutions that we need in an equitable way. So the question in the chat is it, particularly around kind of mobilizing funds for municipalities and making sure that this uh, that these uh, this capital is available at a local level. So maybe Sarah, we could start with you. Can you please share some of your thoughts around now that we have all of this capital mobilized? What are some what's some thinking we need to have around next steps to make sure that it's being implemented well? Yeah, I happily, it's a huge topic. So let me just say, take a couple of whacks at it and then uh, <laughs> pass along to others. I, 
if you're talking about in the United States, which we're about to get a huge amount of money sort of, you know, surging through our system, it is really important to remember that we're pretty bad at building infrastructure, right? It usually comes in late and expensive and, and it's just hard to do. And so there's a lot of work, right? Even with the infrastructure bill, but certainly if Build Back Better, you know, gets passed, to be able to help with local level capacity and project development in the United States, to be candid with you, like much like we think about project develop in developing countries, to move in the rate and the pace and the scale that we're going to need to at the United States, we need so much project development assistance and capacity development at a local level. Quite frankly, it could take all of, you know, everyone who's engaged in the US climate movement to like all hands on deck make sure that gets deployed well. Because the real, real challenge, and I cannot say this enough, is to say that that money is coming and to say that it's creating jobs and then it does not do that. And I think we are, like, that is the A number one risk for the next two years. I think it's a separate question about how you think about mobilizing this money in lots of developing country contexts. And here is where I feel like the next era of our sophistication, like, really needs to take off, which is, we have this notion that there's a lot of private capital that's waiting on the wings, that there's a lot of public you know, mechanisms through development institutions that are ready to create blended finance opportunities in different countries. The key thing to remember is going to be that each of those contexts is exceptionally different from the other. And the approach to, to, to how you mobilize public and private capital in those places is going to be in different, different in different places. So sovereign risk guarantees, all these different ways in which you could do that, they're very important, but we need to use them like, you know, fine-tuned tools rather than like a solution for the entire developing country. But it, it's going to take a lot of effort to do that. Yeah. Jason, I see you went off mute. Oh, yeah, well, I, I, just, I know we only have a minute left. I'll just, I agree with everything Sarah said, and I just would add, uh, when you think about how much additional capital has to be invested in the energy system to get to net zero 2050, more CapEx intensive, lower operating costs, fuel for some of these technologies, you know, the estimates vary, IEA going from two to five trillion, somewhere around 100 trillion uh, cumulatively over the next 30 years, ballpark, maybe three quarters of that is private, one quarter is public ballpark, maybe two thirds of that is the developing and emerging markets, one third of the developed economies. And so we're spending a lot of time as a center with the word global in our name, uh, thinking about how uh, US policy, multilateral banks, development finance institutions can take actions that catalyze that private spending and catalyze investment in the developing world and emerging markets, which face a host of other barriers to putting to, 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 to to putting that capital to work effectively, local currency risk and political risk and lack of experience and capabilities with local financial institutions is a lot of work that needs to be done to get that capital deployed in clean energy in the parts of the world that need it the most. Absolutely. Uh, well, I have to be conscious of time. So unfortunately, I have to wrap, uh, wrap up here. We had a lot of good remaining questions in the Q&A. So please feel free to reach out to our team or the experts to continue the conversation. Thank you so much to our panel for sharing your reflections on COP26 and a broader conversation around the role of innovation to meet these commitments that, uh, that the US and other nations made while in Glasgow. So thank you so much for your time to our audience and please enjoy the rest of your day.